The film commences with a tragic event that occurred on July 4, 1969, at Lover's Lane in Vallejo, California. During the incident, Darlene Farron and Michael Renault were ruthlessly shot multiple times by an unidentified assailant. Regrettably, Darlene succumbs to her injuries, while Mike narrowly survives. Following the brutal act, the perpetrator contacts the authorities via a 911 call to report his action. Approximately four weeks later, a letter from the assailant arrives at the editorial office of the San Francisco Chronicle newspaper. The initial encrypted letter sent by the Zodiac killer marked the beginning of a series of such cryptic correspondence. Alongside the letter, the killer also included a demand that it be published in the newspaper, threatening further violence if ignored. This prompts Paul Avery, a renowned journalist and crime reporter at the San Francisco Chronicle, to commence investigations into the case. The encrypted letter also captures the attention of Robert Graysmith, a political cartoonist. Robert astutely deduces that the identity of the killer is not encoded within the letter, but his insight is dismissed by Avery, who does not include him in the initial investigations. However, over time, a history teacher successfully cracks the encryption. Subsequently, the Zodiac Killer sends numerous additional cipher letters to the Chronicle, posing a challenge for law enforcement to decipher them all. Robert makes diligent attempts to decipher the letters by scouring books from the library, despite Avery's derisive comment. However, once Robert successfully decodes the letter, Avery's attitude towards him changes, and he begins to share more information. Robert's investigation leads him to discover that the letter is a reference to the movie The Most Dangerous Man, which alludes to the concept of a man who hunts other humans, the most dangerous prey. During September of 1969, the Zodiac Killer strikes once more at Lake Berryessa in Napa County. Two individuals, Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard, are stabbed during the attack. Tragically, Shepard succumbs to her injuries, while Hartnell manages to survive. Following the incident, the Zodiac sends a new letter to the Chronicle, proclaiming that man is the most dangerous animal of all. Subsequently, a fortnight after the previous incident, a cab driver named Paul Stein is fatally shot by the Zodiac in San Francisco's Presidio Heights district. The killer then sends fragments of Stein's bloodstained shirt, along with another chilling letter, to the Chronicle. The San Francisco Police Department assigns the case to two of their seasoned detectives, Dave Toshi and his partner, Bill Armstrong. A letter surfaces from the Zodiac Killer, revealing a sinister plan to target school buses in the city. Then, on October 22, 1969, barely two weeks after the cab driver's murder, an individual claiming to be the Zodiac calls into a morning talk show, expressing a desire to speak with lawyer Melvin Belly. The killer agrees to go by the name Sam during the conversation. Melvin inquires, Sam, you need to confide in me and tell me what's troubling you. Sam responds, I don't want to face the gas chamber. I suffer from severe headaches. Melvin probes further, asking how long Sam has been experiencing these headaches. To this, Sam reveals, I've had headaches for a long time, ever since I killed a kid. As Melvin continues to inquire, the call suddenly disconnects. Despite Sam's earlier agreement to meet, he provides directions to a church in Dolly City. Melvin and the SFPD swiftly converge on the location, only to discover that the caller is actually an individual from a mental institution. Even Brian Hartnell, a survivor of a previous attack, confirms that the voice does not match that of the man who shot them at Lake Berrius. Throughout 1969 and 1970, the Zodiac continues to send letters to both Melvin Belly and the Chronicle. These letters serve to taunt the police and claim responsibility for various incidents. However, the Chronicle eventually decides to cease publishing the letters, as Avery raises doubts about the Zodiac's intentions and truthfulness. Avery shares with Robert that he suspects the gun sight symbol used in the Zodiac's letters is copied from the logo of the Zodiac brand of watches. Meanwhile, Avery begins writing compelling stories about the Zodiac and is even rewarded with a personal letter from the killer, along with a fragment of the cab driver's blood-stained shirt. Avery's curiosity about the Zodiac leads him to seek out more information, and he meets with an undisclosed source in Riverside, California. He believes he has discovered evidence of the Zodiac's initial murder victim, prompting Dave and Armstrong to travel to Riverside for further investigation. Despite the striking similarities in the evidence, Dave and Armstrong are not convinced that it matches the profile of the Zodiac killer. However, Avery's story gains traction with the public, convincing many of the killer's identity, although Dave remains skeptical. Following Avery's article, numerous individuals claim to know the true identity of the Zodiac. Among all the interviews conducted, Arthur Lee Allen emerges as a potential suspect. Dave, Armstrong, and Mullinax question Arthur extensively, but their efforts yield no significant progress. Due to their suspicions, they also interview Arthur's family, 
who willingly provide handwriting samples for comparison. However, Sherwood Mora, upon examining the handwriting samples from Arthur and the killer, finds no connection or match between the two. After extensive investigation, they discover that Arthur has been relocated to Santa Rosa. A warrant is obtained from the Santa Rosa PD, and Dave and Armstrong search Arthur's trailer. Arthur returns home during the search, and a new handwriting sample and fingerprint comparison are taken but none of the evidence matches the information in the Zodiac file. Dave becomes frustrated as he was convinced that Arthur was the Zodiac killer. Four years have passed, and life has taken different turns for everyone. Robert has remarried and has begun rebuilding her family. Paul Avery has left the Chronicle and is now employed by the Sacramento Bee. Dave Toshi is taken aback when his partner, Bill Armstrong, informs him of his decision to leave the homicide and transfer to the fraud department. Over the course of these four years, the Zodiac Killer has remained inactive. Robert's wife, Melanie, reminds him of the collection of Zodiac-related material he has accumulated. Upon realizing this, Robert pays a visit to Avery to discuss his intention of writing a book about the Zodiac. However, Avery appears disinterested and informs Robert that he has lost all the information pertaining to the killer, much to Robert's disappointment. Robert rushes towards Dave Toshi for help. Dave initially claims he cannot assist, but he discreetly advises Robert to seek out Ken Narlow in Napa. After a brief period of silence, Narlow instructs Robert to review the evidence collected by the Napa police in the case of Darlene Farron and Michael Renault. Following a meticulous investigation, Robert approaches Dave once again to share his findings. Robert reveals that Darlene had multiple admirers, and it is plausible that the Zodiac could be one of them. He further explains that on the night of Darlene's murder, she received suspicious phone calls with heavy breathing on the line. Based on the gathered information, Robert becomes convinced that the killer had a personal connection with Darlene. He expresses his desire to meet Darlene's sister, but Dave suggests reaching out to Melvin Belly instead. As Robert waits for the lawyer to arrive, one of his housekeepers informs him that the Zodiac had spoken to her. In Melvin Belly's absence, the Zodiac reportedly informed the housekeeper that he had committed a murder on his birthday. Robert uses this information to narrow down the possible dates to December 18th through the 20th. He follows Dave's recommendation and checks the Department of Justice for information, but finds limited assistance from it. Shortly thereafter, Robert receives a call alleging that Rick Marshall is the true Zodiac killer and that Bob Vaughn has filmed canisters containing evidence that implicates Rick. Robert consults Sherwood Morrow regarding fingerprints and handwriting samples of the killer. In the meantime, Sherwood reveals that a man named Wallace Penny had previously told him about a certain Rick Marshall being the Zodiac. Robert is startled to learn that the same man who called him had also spoken to Sherwood. At the Chronicle, Toshi urgently arrives after being informed that the department has received the first new Zodiac letter in four years. However, some accuse Dave of fabricating the letter for publicity, leading to his removal from the homicide division. Robert attempts to question Dave about Rick Marshall, but Dave refuses to provide any answers. Robert then travels to Napa to speak with Ken Narla, who reveals that he had previously interviewed Rick Marshall but was unable to obtain any fingerprints or handwriting samples from him. In his quest to locate Marshall, Robert contacts Moore and obtains the contact information for Wallace Penny. Penny shares with Robert a poster that Rick Marshall had drawn for a silent movie theater. Morrill identifies some minor similarities to the Zodiac style, but requires further details. Robert's obsession with the Zodiac case begins to take a toll on his personal life as he loses his job at the Chronicle, and his wife takes their children and leaves the house due to fear of the Zodiac. Robert has been receiving unsettling calls with heavy breathing on his phone. Despite this, he persists in his efforts to locate Linda, the sister of Darlene Farron, for assistance. He also reaches out to Bob Vaughn for help, who reveals that he knew Rick Marshall from their days as theater projectionists. When Robert asks Bob about the posters, Bob claims that he himself had drawn all of them, not Rick. Despite his efforts, Robert's inquiries do not yield any significant progress. However, he eventually manages to meet Linda, Darlene's sister, who is currently incarcerated. Robert questions Linda about a painting party where she had an uncomfortable encounter with someone. But to Robert's surprise, Linda refutes his assumption that it was Rick Marshall, instead identifying the person as someone named Lee. Robert quickly deduces that Linda is referring to Arthur Lee Allen. He urgently heads to Dave Tosh's residence in the dead of night. Although Dave is initially reluctant, they eventually go out for a meal and discuss the various suspicious individuals who could potentially be the Zodiac killer. They both agree that Arthur Lee Allen is a plausible suspect. However, Dave informs Robert that there is no concrete evidence to support this theory, leaving Robert at a loss for words. Dave continues to offer his support for Gray Smith's book on the Zodiac case. 
The story then progresses to December 1983, where Robert unexpectedly encounters Arthur Lee Allen in a hardware store in Vallejo. He is momentarily frozen in shock, unable to react, and eventually leaves the store without saying a word. In 1991, after the passage of eight years, Michael Renault is invited by the authorities to identify potential suspects from a set of mugshots. After careful observation, he points out Arthur Lee Allen as the individual who is most likely to be the Zodiac. The saddest reality of the movie Zodiac is the unresolved mystery that consumes the character, from the taunting and elusive Zodiac killer to the toll it takes on the detectives and journalists. The unending hunt, devastating impact on victims' families, and constant fear and paranoia create a haunting and tragic atmosphere. The film portrays the dark reality of an unsolved case, where closure remains elusive, leaving scars that never fully heal.